Hi everybody. So people have asked me a few times about how I go about fingering like sax lines on the guitar, and it's a bit of a tricky one, um, especially if you're mostly used to playing guitar music. Um, I just want to sort of share some hints and pointers with you here. Um, I think on the whole it's actually not that hard and there's usually a solution, but um, it can be a bit you know, intimidating or strange if you're used to playing music that's designed around the guitar or intuitively or on purpose, you know? So um, one of the things, we're going to work on bebop heads today because obviously a lot of bebop heads are written by horn players or pianists, non-guitarists in any case, and contain like um, challenges for a guitarist that you might not necessarily come across in guitar music. Um, so my sort of point number one is that it's best to learn them by ear. Um, now that might seem awkward at first or you know a lengthy process, but there's a couple of very good reasons for that. The first thing is, I don't know about you, but when I read music, I tend to think in positions. And I don't think this is really helpful for a lot of bop heads. So, for instance, if I play Anthropology in third position, I mean, it's fine. There's a lot of awkward string crossing, which will make it hard to play fast. Okay? Um, so, I think by learning things by ear, you're much more likely to naturally adopt sort of intuitively fingerings that work or at least that's been my experience you might find that different but that's that's how it's generally been for me um the other thing is that a lot of um transcriptions that are commercially available even things like the omnibook have mistakes in them as well like little errors uh, rhythmic problems like that are rhythmic rhythms that aren't quite right maybe um some funny accidentals so for instance um somebody was talking about uh, billy's bounce the other day and billy's bounce has uh, a little section that goes like this but a lot of people play this so the difference is A flat and an A unless you know the, the tune very well you might not necessarily spot that difference but it is a difference um, you know but to be fair George Benson plays the one with the A flat. Parker plays the one with the A. So, but um, if you just go from the the music, then you might not realise that there's a difference at all. Um, Adam Lee's also made the point well about phrasing. So, for like four, for instance, you know the length of those notes, you wouldn't necessarily pick that up from the music. It's good to learn by ear. You pick up a lot of uh, details as well, such as you know um, exactly how long the notes last, um, little trills and turns. That I'll talk a little bit about later and stuff like this. Little details which you might not pick up if you're looking at the Omnibook, for instance. Okay, now having sort of started to learn something by ear, and this may be a slow process at first, but stick with it. It's great learning. It's some of the best learning you can do. You uh, may find there's some uh, questions about where exactly you play this stuff on the guitar, and what octave and what position. So for instance, you know, if I play Moose the Mooch, the original kind of, you know, octave for that is this. <laughs> Nobody really plays it up there. Most people play it down here. Most guitarists. It sounds better down there on the guitar, I think. Uh, maybe this will sound good if you were playing in a very busy mix with lots of, you know, with a piano and loads of uh, loads of instruments, and you were playing in unison with the sax player. But I find like playing in a lower octave often works well, especially for tunes in B flat. Um, for some things it seems to work well to play it in the original key. So I quite like Chi Chi, for instance. I quite like it up here. <laughs> I like it up there. Uh, things like Donna Lee seem to work well down here. You know, so um, you kind of got to follow your judgment with this. I think um, uh, you can maybe learn it a few different positions and maybe a few different octaves and see how it goes. Um, and there's no reason why you can't just like change the octave in the middle of a, um, uh, you know, in the middle of a, a head if, if you want to. So, if, I mean, for things like a. Uh, Hot house, it's like up there, you know, it's very high. So that's all right on a one ES one seven five. But if I'm playing it on a, um, you know, one of my arch tops, one of my guitars that doesn't have a, you know, as good top axis such as my arch top that doesn't have any cutaway, then um, obviously I'll need to think of a different solution because that's going to be difficult to play, right? Um, so there's some practicalities um, with playing things on the guitar about that. Position wise. It probably vary from instrument to instrument, but I quite like playing bop heads down here. Part of the reason for that is I've got a wooden bridge, so the intonation is not always amazing. <laughs> Further up the guitar, 
And I kind of like this kind of area as well. It kind of has a good cutting tonality to it, which works well in a band, whereas um, things get a little bit more mushy up here. But, you know, it depends from instrument to instrument, and maybe you like the mushy sound, maybe you think it's softer, maybe you think it sounds more like, um, you know, a tenor sax or something. So, you know, I notice Pasquale Grasso plays a lot up here, so, you know, <laughs> my opinions are null and void, but that's just how I hear it. Um, now, um, I like, uh, when, when I phrase things, I like to think about how the notes relate to each other. So, for instance, in um, anthropology, we have uh, this little phrase. <laughs> But to play that strictly in position, it breaks up this little figure here, which is... It's actually an enclosure, isn't it? It's a semitone above and below the target note, which is the third. And you'll notice that I'm using a little bit of a mini position shift to first of all get down to that note, and then slide back into position. Works very nicely to have a legato connection between those two notes. So I'm only picking one note and slurring using a slide and then going like that. Yeah, I've changed the way I figure that first little section as well. So Hot House is a little section that goes like this. And to me it makes sense to finger that. Thinking about you know, these notes of the triad because that phrase kind of embellishes them with little filigree. Little sort of um, extra notes, passing notes, uh, neighbour tones, whatever you call them, you know, <laughs> around those sort of notes. So to try and finger that in position would be A, very difficult, and also I don't think it would suit the nature of the phrase. Now, um, I just wanted to talk quickly about arpeggios and string crossing, because there's a lot of that. So for instance, if I take anthropology, then the first few notes of that are... If I play that all with the first finger, just B-flat triad in second position, as in it's an inversion, um, so it's F, B-flat, D. I can hop my first finger, but that's awkward. I can try and do one of those rolling bars, or you might get that kind of a thing going on, where the notes just run into each other, which is, I think, a bit ugly. So I've just kind of used different fingers. That might be a little bit awkward at first for people, um, but I do find that it kind of, uh, in the long run, it actually makes it easier. You know, I can play all that with th three fingers if I need to. So that's that's the way I do that. And this gives me a little bit more rhythmic control, I think. You know, it's for things like segment as well. wherever you play it it's like in that position even in that position you still got to deal with you know you've got to deal with string crossing where the, the note is the same sorry the fret number is the same on each string so therefore I feel like um, using separate fingers can you know help with that um, certainly helps with clarity and sort of um, rhythmic control I find um, now, playing arpeggios across the string, um, in general, bebop sort of follows um, a melodic contour where it goes up the arpeggio and down the scale. So uh, because of that, um, it makes sense to economy pick some of those scales, and I usually economy pick downwards, I don't tend to economy pick upwards. So for instance, you know, if I'm playing this little phrase from Donnelly. <laughs> notice that I'm using the hammer on uh, often arpeggios are decorated in bop with a lower neighbor tone this is no exception I could do it with a you know alternate picking as well these are only eighth notes but when you get to things like this it makes sense to sweep them um, I'm trying to think of a specific example from the repertoire, but I can't off the top of my head. But this kind of stuff is, I mean, there's a tune I wrote which goes like... You know... Uh, it's hard to play up there. <laughs> yeah, can't do it. Anyway, um, so because of that, um, you'll, you'll often see jazz guitarists economy picking those sort of rapid triplets. So this is like, for instance, one and two and a three and two and a three, there's nothing wrong with that at all. You can also, of course, 
You know, uh, for instance, for an urge, you know, you can sweep downwards as well. Which is, you know, the only way to play that phrase really on the guitar. But on the whole, I find that I don't need to sweep upwards too much. Um, you do get the sending up edgios. Here's an example from Moose the Mooch. And I generally just alternate pick those. It's um, a little bit tricky at first, but you know, some people might prefer to upsweep them. I find it very awkward with the way I hold the pick and everything. Um, but it's something to watch out for. But definitely for ascending arpeggios, I think. Economy picking works extremely well and is easy to do. Um, moving on, um, scalar figures. So there's some phrasing things about scalar figures that you can incorporate. So uh, horn players tend to uh, practice uh, for their phrasing, they tend to practice accenting or even slurring from the upbeat onto the downbeat. So by that I mean, for instance, Donna Lee. One, two, three and a four and one and two and three. Right, so. So that's one, two, three, four, one. You see I'm slurring. I'm slurring from the, um, the pick note, which is on the upbeat, down onto the downbeat. So I'm picking on the ands. One and a two and three and four and one, like that. <laughs> I kind of find it quite hard to do that tempo. I, I usually pick it like this. So I, I don't necessarily do that all the way through. But it's something you might want to practice. You can do this like for Hot House. And if you did it all of it, there'd be um, one, one, oh, it's da, 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 isn't it? One, two, and three, yeah. One, two, and three, one, two, and three, one, two, and three. So that, that's, you know, that's something you can play around with. Two, and three, four, and one, and two, and three, one, two, and three, four, one, and two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, you know, that's something, oh, it's actually quite hard to do pull-offs on this guitar, but it's something which you can sort of experiment with um, uh, and just incorporate enough of it to kind of bring your phrasing to life. It, it does help, um, I find, um, especially as a lot of these things are quite pick-intensive as well. It also has the happy uh, sort of benefit of making you have to do less with your right hand, which uh, for bop heads is very welcome. Um, and with that in mind, I think little trills and turns and things like that. Um, for instance, there's a nice little turn in Hot House. Notice how I'm using a few legato techniques there just to add shape to it. Most of the notes are picked, but... That's, that's a little... Today. A little uh, hammer on pull off thing, and then uh. that little slide there is very horn like on the guitar. I don't think I've even got all of the twiddles in there, I think there's more twiddles like things like <laughs> which I, you know, for years I was just playing, but actually. It's actually something more like that. So that these little things can really help bring your bring your phrasing to life. Um, listen out for them. They're not always obvious at first, uh, but which is one good reason not to pick them because if you pick them, they might become too prominent. Um, one problem with the guitar is everything you play becomes very emphatic, whereas actually on a horn, people almost can throw notes away. Um, yeah, um, there's a few other things which might pose difficulties to people. One thing is definitely like skips and intervals. Um, so for instance, um, you know, like in, in Donnelly we have this phrase. Oh, sorry. That's quite hard to finger. <laughs> Most people struggle with that, so, so yeah, keep playing it wrong. So that is um, really a challenge for the right hand as well as the left. And the way I 
time to do it is I think like one of the worst things you can do for string skips is this. Try, you know, so you've got your pick straight into the guitar and you're trying to avoid the next string over. Um, string crossing is a tricky one for most people. Um, the way I deal with it is I, I'm a downward rest stroke picker, so my pick goes into the guitar, which means that it comes out of the plane of the guitar and then I'm free to move to another string. So I've not found this stuff generally to be too difficult. There. Excuse me. You know, but a bail, but a. That's okay for me. Um, it's obviously not crazy fast, but. You know, again, like things like, like uh, you know, picking um, open voice to triads as well has similar challenges to it. Um, the other thing, um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend that uh, over like sort of, you know, trying to hop over the strings as Troy Grady calls it. Um, you might find a different approach. It's not the only way to do it, but it's the way I do it. Um, I was just thinking actually that the other thing is that sometimes you can just get away with hammering notes. <laughs> so you can actually use your fretting hand to articulate some of the notes as well. And I think people like Kurt Rosenwinkel and John Schofield and Pat Metheny do a lot of that actually. Um, so it's not cheating. Like for instance, if you hear Pat Metheny play a phrase like that, he's only picking the top note. Yeah, does that sort of thing a lot, right? Um, you know, again, like for bebop heads. And that kind of fits the horn-like nature of it because those notes are often thrown away. In, in bop phrasing, often it's the high notes that are emphasized while the low notes are almost kind of ghost notes sometimes. Sometimes it's hard to get a fix on exactly what pitch they have. So I definitely recommend all of these things, um, uh, you know, as, as ways of kind of confronting the problems and challenges that bop heads throw up. Um, anyway, um, I hope you find that useful and um, let me know any comments or any hints that you might have.